You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm Jared Mounts. Uh, we have a really cool guest for a lake that people either love or mostly hate, I think, generally yeah. speaking, because uh, it gets the best of them all the time. Yeah. It, it's haunted. It's revered. It's like Frederick out in Front Royal. Um, it's it's a tough nut to crack. It really is. But I think we have the guru here that can That's probably right. help us uh, yeah. unveil some of that. And it's known for big bass. But yeah, Greg Sanders uh, goes way back uh, and was a river fisherman. Uh, we're gonna let I'm gonna let him introduce himself. But you know, he was uh, known on the Shenandoah River um, as an angler. And then um, I don't know how many years ago we'll let him tell us. Opened up. Uh, Gregory's Lakeside Bait and Tackle, which sits right on that Lake Frederick property. So um, you're not kidding. I mean, he's there all the time. He's seeing, he fishes the water. He is in direct contact with the anglers coming off the water. And so uh, if anybody knows that lake, uh, it's going to be him. So we're excited to have him on. Um, Greg, you want to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself that may not know you? And then we'll dive right into Lake Frederick. Well, I've been been fishing for a few years. Uh, opened up the lake, the bait shop out at Lake Frederick. Uh, this was my sixth year. Oh wow! Congratulations! Of operating the shop. That's Thank awesome. You. Um, I've been fishing Lake Frederick since uh, about nineteen. Well, I fished it the first time in nineteen eighty four, and uh, I've fished it quite a bit over the last few years. And um, the lake has changed over the last okay. few years changed tremendously um i used to fish a lot of tournaments but if you ever want to have to stop fishing you open up a bait shop that's and then right. you can't then fish you no fish. more that's right you're working all the time so uh <clears throat> had some pretty good success fishing tournaments um won quite a few tournaments on the shenandoah and some other places but uh lake frederick is tough to fish there's fish there and they bite you just you got to know how to catch them and you have to you have to progress with the lake. The lake's progressed; it, it's went in different directions over the past thirty years. Are you looking for a really cool marketing opportunity to help grow your business? What would you think if your business logo ended up on every YouTube video we create? Plus, you get a commercial slot for every single podcast. If you're interested in helping support our channel, please reach out to me at fishingthedmv at gmail dot com. The email address again is fishingthedmv at gmail dot com. Talk about the cycles. Yeah, if you so could. I was gonna say, talk about that. What you've seen change since 1984? How has it changed? Well, back back in the day when we first started fishing the lake, uh, several eight, nine, ten pound bass caught mm -hmm. every day. You was there fishing. I mean, you could catch. Uh, it was nothing to go out there and and catch six, seven pound bass, mm -hmm. and repeatedly. I mean, you could catch fish all day long. Um this 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 past year it's really hard to catch a, a decent right. fish there um and throughout the years um the baits have remained the same quite a bit but with the loss of the grass with the silting of the bottom with you know the fish are in different areas what do you think contributed to the loss of grass grass carp grass carp okay Yes. All right. What yeah. do you mean? Talk about that a little bit more. Well, it's a it's a Department of Wildlife Resources wants to make it uh, fishable to everybody, even right. if you don't have a boat. They want to make it fishable if you need to fish from the bank. Mm -hmm. And there were grass carp introduced. Um, I don't know how many years ago. It's been a while. Ten years, you think? Uh, it's been longer than that. And the grass just, I mean, it used to be Lake Frederick had a wall of grass that did the whole circumference of the lake, no matter where you went. I mean, it was really fun punching the grass, catching the big fish. You, Everywhere you went, you see a hole in the grass, you put, drop a jig, you drop a creature bait down in there. Most likely you was going to catch pretty good fish. Mm -hmm. what, what, what years were that? Or you think like in general when the grass was that thick, just to uh, give a timeline of this whole thing? I'm going to say... Um, you know, mm -hmm. 2005, okay. 2000 to 2005. The was, grass the, was the heyday of the thick grass, okay. Yeah, yeah. 
and um, and then the grass carp were introduced. Um, they cleaned it out pretty pretty quickly. They cleaned the, cleaned the grass out. And I, there's still grass carp in there. Um, hmm. Not as many as there were. They mm. haven't stocked any for a lot of years. Um, we're starting to get some grass coming back. That's good. Um, I, I think it's good that it comes back on its own. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know I think we need to our our biologists at DWR are very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. They're very good at what they do, mm -hmm. and I think we just need to put faith in <clears throat> them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and let them handle our lake because mm -hmm. they, they do a good job. Mm -hmm. So it's what, uh, like, so the deck, talk a little bit about for those who don't know the depth of it, it's very deep and clear, um, the lake. But what kind of, I guess, what I'm getting to is grass can only grow, you know, less than 20 foot because of sunlight penetration in there. So when you talk about grass around the ring. Um, I'm assuming shallow out to a certain point, then you're going to drop off and start to get some depth. Lake Frederick's not as clear as it was years ago. Mm, really? I don't know if it's because of the construction. Mm. I, you know, the, all the houses mm. being built, but Lake Frederick is not as clear as what it was even five years ago. Really? Hmm. So, um, so a timeline is early 2000s, tons of grass, no houses, because that didn't really happen until mm. probably what, 10 years ago? maybe ish around there roughly. Mm -hmm. So you had tons of grass, no construction, and then grass carp were introduced, which eradicated the grass. Then we have construction. Um, Cause I remember when I lived in Fairfax, we would drive out there to see this place. And mm -hmm. it kind of goes with what you said, even when I was a little kid, I remember like there were no damn houses. There was nothing. It was mm -hmm. Dino World, which is a cool place guys. If you want to check that out, there's <laughs> Dino World that we'd always hit. And then we go to Lake Frederick and you drive past this little road and there and then yeah, boom, there's yeah. nothing. It's just this cool little oasis. Um, and then it kind of is interesting now that all these things are getting connected in my mind where then like there's no grass, uh -huh. you have construction, and now you're saying the water is not as clean. And it's just so interesting how all these things get connected where the mm -hmm. natural filter's gone, and then now you're just tearing mm -hmm. up the earth with housing. Now they mm -hmm. do they do a lot of extensive studies on the water quality at Lake Frederick. And the water quality is great. Mm -hmm. The water quality is fine. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's a, a runoff, a silt issue. Mm -hmm. Um, I I can remember 10 years ago, there's actually cars in the bottom of Lake Frederick. Um, they're in about 18 to 20 feet of water. 10 years ago, I could go over top of them with my boat and look down and tell you that it was a Volkswagen, an Oldsmobile Delta 88 parked hmm. bumper to bumper. Is you can't, right? you can't see them now. So it's, it, it's not as clear as it used to Interesting. be. Interesting. Okay. I, I think it's still very clean water. And, mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah. And, uh, but it's just not, you know, we, 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 back in the day, we were used to fishing super clear water. Now we're not fishing super clear water. Right. We're fishing a little dirtier water now, which mm. I would rather fish dirtier water right. than clean water. Yeah. yeah. But that, and that's just something where if you guys ever fish a lake that is chock full of grass, you know, grass is a natural filter. Mm. Um, and I just, when we talk about the, the grass carp, even Odenkirk said this, like, you know, his constituents, there's only so much of the lake is allowed to be in grass because that's what mm -hmm. they want. And even he said, like, with the with the grass carp, they had an issue at Lake, lake Anna where they put too many in. Mm -hmm. And they are indiscriminate. Like, you might say, like, this mm -hmm. creek has too much grass. Well, they don't care. They're going to eat there and then they're going to come mm -hmm. over here. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's all interesting to paint this picture where, like, yeah, this is, this lake has evolved a little bit, but how much of it was because this is what we did to it? And that was an interesting point too. The fact that we just always you know, keep saying about opinions and everybody's got them. And even within the state, there's different mm -hmm. people that have different ideas about yes. what is good, what is not, what is, and we talked earlier too about just all your different recreational users too. And that is the other reality. Like obviously anglers, we like grass, we like vegetation, but your kayakers, maybe not so much, <laughs> you know, different, different users. And so trying to balance all that, that, you know, that can be a challenge. You can't make everybody happy. You can't make everybody happy. But to your point, the fishing, the fishing, and how you fish changed has changed yes, over the years. But uh, let, let's keep in mind when when the lake was opened up, it was dedicated as a fishing lake. Okay, it's mm -hmm. not good dedicated point. as a recreational. That's a good lake. point. It is designated as a fishing lake, and that has changed. That has as changed. Well. Yeah. And that's what's so hard is it seems like the, the outdoorsy people, believe it or not, want things to be like it was. It's the people that come in and buy a, a summer home 
that just kayak mm -hmm. once or twice, they're the ones that have an idea of what nature is supposed to look mm -hmm. like. And they're the ones that want to change it. Cause I think most bass fishermen, if you gave us that, that weedy, like feral lake, we'd love it. Mm -hmm. But it, it's Stephanie who's flying in here from Seattle, who mm -hmm. wants a place to kayak, who like, well, we got to kill all the weeds. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure there's a good Instagram photo here. Mm -hmm. And I want a house right here. Right. This is my idea of what nature is supposed to be right. like. But hunters that have three generation hunters, like that's mm -hmm. not what the outdoors is. Mm -hmm. um, that is a know. challenge too, between you even think the, the bass boat, you know, versus the kayak or the, the bass boat angler versus the kayak angler or just a strictly kayak or oh, just recreational. Kayaker, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not anti kayak or <clears throat> type thing, but you do hear that too, where if there's not a mutual respect, uh, if you see, and just an example too, if, if you are listening to this and you're out there and you see an angler working a stretch and you're a kayaker, don't go between them and the bank or where no, they're yeah. fishing. Like, and that's true of even anglers. But they, should, they, they don't know. They don't it, understand. It, yeah, and that's why I say that though, like educating it's the an education users that thing. we need to work together and, and would, respect each other on the water. You know, we, we rent kayaks to mm -hmm. people who've mm -hmm. never been on a kayak right, before. Right. We rent them and, and, you know, we have that conversation with right. them. Hey, when you see a guy fishing, right. kind of give him a wide berth and Correct. don't, you know. Yeah, I that's mean, right. And it's just a lot of people don't know. Yeah. But once they know, you don't have Most that problem anymore. Most of them are respect it, yeah. And yeah. that's why I bring it up because mm -hmm. I think it's a good, it's an educational thing. If you didn't know, you know, just a little and common sense. Goes you you have people that go, I mean, you have, Lake Frederick is different because you got fishermen who think they own the lake. You got... <laughs> People who live in houses who think they own the lake, you have a divide, you have an us and them mentality on the lake. Then you have the boat ramp where you have kayakers come down mm -hmm. and they set their kayaks <laughs> on the boat yeah, ramp. Right. Then you get people with boats on trailers <laughs> that run over in. the kayaks when yeah. they're putting their boat in. Yeah. And then I have literally sit there in the shop and watched people fist fighting on the boat ramp wow. and have people come up and they're like, are you going to do anything about that? And I'm like, my authority stops right here at right. the door. Yeah. That's that's on them. And he's just selling minnows and worms and yeah, shop. Yeah. And it's like, and then you, you don't think about that though. And again, in this geographic area, all the different things that are happening and all the different angles that people are looking at. And when they all come together, that's why sometimes we get this. And but I like people his mentality. Realize. He's talking about how can we all work together? Well, well the, the, the big thing is the lake is 117 acres. Right. There's room for everybody. Right. And, you know, in this day and age, we're, we're losing so many hunters every year. Mm -hmm. We're losing so many fishermen every year. And, you know, DWR, if we don't have DWR, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now they have an access permit for D or from DWR for department-owned bodies of water for mm -hmm. people who do not have a hunting license or mm -hmm. do not have a fishing gotcha. license or a boat registration. Gotcha. If they want to use the facility, mm -hmm. then they need to have the access permit. And, you know, when you explain to people what it's all about mm -hmm. and why they why they need it, mm -hmm. they're fine with yes. it. Yes. They're fine with it. Um, but you, you, you have people, you got people who are going to complain. You know, somebody's paying $23 for a fishing license and you yeah. think they ask them for their firstborn son. But most of us know, too, the good, what we like about this organization is that we know that those dollars are going back to exactly. help ensure exactly. the resource. And so that's, so we're anybody's been in and we we could could you you, you said something about like a, the diminishing amount of fishermen and hunters with your shop and, and the fantastic thing that was the covid years what have you seen since you're basically there on the ground every day is there been a, a decrease in fishermen and, and hunters that yes. you've seen even with really? the covid years and stuff well covid was you can't put that into the equation it's different <laughs> we were the only thing open right the people could do. We did mm -hmm. 2,100 rentals that oh, year. Wow. Shit. So you, you can't even think about that. You get a vacation home out of that? I look at that now <laughs> and I'm like, that's nuts. Maybe yeah. we need another COVID, COVID. hit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a steady decline. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a steady decline in six years. Mm -hmm. I went from a normal year of first year I was open, almost 1,700 boat rentals. Um, last year we are at, 1200 boat rentals this year we're just we'll break a thousand so it, it is a steady decline now i wonder too are you getting um i'm wondering how many are active because i know 
kayaks went through the roof during that same time as far as trying to like people buying their own. So we, one I'm two, seeing more. I'm seeing more usage. people showing okay. up with their own kayaks, gotcha. with their own Makes boats, sense, yeah. and and that's great. Right. That that's fine as right. long as we got people using that resource, using yeah. the resource. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. I you know I do that because I want to make money. Right. But to see the lake full mm -hmm. is nice. Okay. Now, six years ago. You couldn't get a parking spot, not even in the upper parking lot. It would be parked really? full. Wow. You could look out on the lake and you could see anywhere from 75 to 125 kayaks and boats wow. at one time. I've got pictures that wow. sh showed that. We haven't had a vehicle park in the upper parking lot in two years. Huh. So it's not... Um, this year, I, 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 you know... With prices of everything, you know, True. a lot of people are, they're either going to put gas in their tank and groceries on their table, right. or they're going to go fishing. Right. Well, I know if that was me, mm -hmm. I'd be putting gas in my tank going to work. How mm -hmm. much of it is also, and this might not be it, but the narrative that the lake sucks. Because I'm telling, and what I mean by that is like, if you yeah. talk to anyone that fishes and they're like, oh, like Frederick, phew, give me a stiff drink. Let me tell you about that place. And that rumor creates its own, like its mm -hmm. its own mythos around this place. That like that place is and hard to fish. There's a lot of truth to that because I can remember even go back and you know this too, Shando River. And I can like I for me, I remember fishing the North Fork of Shando, which hadn't changed in how many years, and it used to be phenomenal. We'd float it several times a year, and then when it turned into the Dead Sea, they had to fish kill and stuff, and you you weren't catching, you mm -hmm. weren't catching, and then year after year, and then eventually what you did, you did to your point, you changed behavior and said. I'm not going, I'm not going because I'm not going to catch anything anyway. And so there, there could be some truth to that. Well, th th this goes back to what I was talking about, the, the lake evolving over the last right. 30 years. You have to evolve your fishing with style yes. with the lake. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'm kind of fortunate because I can sit there at my desk and I hear people, you know, oh, hey, I mm -hmm. caught two or three here. Or, hey, I caught mm -hmm. five doing mm -hmm. this. And I, so I can put that all together. Right. And it used to be, um, before the blueback herring were introduced, um, you could pound the bank and catch fish. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't understand that Lake Frederick has a thermocline. Mm -hmm. It develops a thermocline in the summertime that runs from about 19 to 26 feet. You can see it on your fish finder if you, mm -hmm. if you get out there. Um, you're not going to catch fish down there. I mean, you got mm -hmm. the Dead Sea below that. Right. Um, fish will go down in that thermocline, mm -hmm. chase a bait, whatever, but mm -hmm. they're going to hang out above it. Mm -hmm. So ideally, what you would do is find structure between 19 and 26 feet in the summer months, and that's mm -hmm. where you'd catch your fish. Gotcha. Now, since we have blueback herring, your blueback herring are out in 30 feet of water, just being blueback herring. And your bass are underneath those blueback herring when they're actively feeding. And that's where you're going to be out there jigging spoons, throwing swim baits. Um, sexy shed is an awesome color because if you look at a blueback herring, um, you know, the sexy shed was designed right after a blueback herring. Gotcha. And if you get out there with a six inch swim bait, that's a sexy shed, you, you should catch some good and fish. And what depth are you catching these fish at or, or would you target... I angler? would fish anywhere from 12 to 16 feet. Okay. And for the people that don't know, uh, I talk about this a lot because I actually cut my teeth in college fishing, fishing for bluebacks down like Lake Murray, Lake Hartwell. Think of it like a, a pelagic tuna and pelagic just means it's open water and it just constantly swims in the middle of nowhere, basically, um, all throughout the lake. And bass will get into wolf packs and they'll hunt them and follow them almost like sharks that, you know searching for tuna um and it very it makes a very unique fishery um to, to to say the least it's it's really cool to watch that what you were just talking about the wolf pack because you can i can i was sitting on the pier just a couple of weeks ago and almost this commotion hmm. out in 30 feet of water i mean there was just it was the water looked like it was bubbling and i literally saw a blueback herring come like four feet out of the water and the bass were just crushing them. It was just like, there had to be like 30 bass there just crushing mm -hmm. that school bluebacks. And they were actually knocking them up out of the water. It was it was pretty awesome. I wished I would have had my phone and filmed that because it was really awesome. And, and it's crazy because like, so a lot of the lakes guys down south that, that have blueback, what they have is they have very clear water, 
they're very deep and they're devoid of a lot of of natural structure and cover on the mm. shorelines and what that does is it, it really i think it pushes the bass into becoming this like nomadic feeder because hey this is what this is what we can eat right now this mm-hmm. is where the most prominent bait is and that changes the behavior and i think when you when you have we don't have docks on lake frederick mm-hmm. and when you kill off a lot of the grass mm-hmm. it, it pushes those fish even more to Correct. becoming this because Correct. what is their other option I mean, there are laydowns and stuff, and I know I hamper on this a lot too, but it's like, these are the things, like when we talk about the evolution of the lake and it ties back into panoptics, Mm -hmm. where if you want to fish a blueback lake and you do not have forward facing sonar, it makes it really hard because I mean, again, now Lake Frederick is smaller than like Lake Hartwell or Murray, but you got to be with that that school of fish so with that said if you don't have those that new technology electronics what what else are you then so we got a depth and some different things to be throwing so what where are you we got to obviously get off the bank um I what look are some for, other things you're looking for i look for the because the blueback herring are constantly busting the top of the water okay. you see them if you just go out there and sit you'll mm-hmm. find the school mm-hmm. that they're constantly gotcha. busting the top of the water when you're out there in your boat and you see them fish busting and you know over mm-hmm. 30 feet of water Get over there and throw your swim right. bait because mm-hmm. that's that's where they're at. Right. And now the schools of blueback herring out there are huge. Yeah. I mean, they are. I, I saw a school come past the pier early this spring and and the school was 200 feet long. Wow. 50, 75 feet wide no and probably 10 foot deep. Holy and it was solid smokes. fish. Mm. So it's they're, they're huge schools of blueback herring. And so, that makes it hard too. I've heard if there is a lot of food, what? Why are they going to eat your, what you're throwing at them, your jerk bait or crank bait or whatever? When there's so much food out there, they're less apt to. You know what I mean? Like there is a that's, balance to uh, that e- too. Everybody has to adjust their fishing style. You know, you used to be able to go to Lake Frederick, throw a wacky rig cinco, green pumpkin, or natural shad, or, or you know, the color of your choice, mm-hmm. and you know, you could throw it up into the brush and catch a five or six pound fish. Mm-hmm. It was that simple. You don't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's like you have to, pr- you you have to change your fishing style, correct, to mimic that that feed. Mm-hmm. And that takes time, and I think that's what's hard for a lot of people. Somebody that's not willing to put in the time mm-hmm. on the water, you know, to learn that uh, because it's not like you're going to go out there the yeah. first day either and catch fish the first time you go out. Well, anything can happen. It but, could, like, uh, yeah, but you the man, the person that's going to actually stay dedicated to it, and that's yeah. what's hard, though, to that point, not many people want, they want that instant gratification. They want right. that instant catch, and, I mean, I got to go out there, you know, four or five, six, eight times over six weeks to try that's to That's why I like out. fishing in Shenandoah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Do you see that, like, sunny days versus cloudy days have a different catch rate on people when they go out there? Rainy days versus clear days. If it's rainy, yeah. Interesting. Uh, they they feed crazy when it's raining. When it's now, raining. the lake will turn over sometime in September. The thermal climb will go away. Um, how that all works, I don't know. Why it's there, I, I, mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, when the lake turns over, you'll see, you'll see moss and stuff floating on top of the lake. You'll have an odor of like, Ooh, that stinks like rotting vegetation the lake's turned over and then your water's the same temperature from top to bottom you don't have the thermocline anymore then your fish are moving back up you know to the bank if they're not chasing herring they're going back to the bank and uh, you, you they get more active they this feed be more. september october yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's it it, it depends mm, on right. temperature mm-hmm. water temperature yeah but that's yeah. good. That's another good tip. You know, it's just, and it's stuff like this. The reason mm-hmm. we're saying this is the person too that can pick up on these tips. You know, you'll increase your chances of success if you'll listen to what he's saying here. Mm-hmm. Well, we change we tr- your style to your point. You know, we try. We we talk to the fishermen when they come in. You know, how'd you do? Mm-hmm. What'd you catch? We relay anything that we that mm-hmm. might give somebody an opportunity to Correct. catch a fish. We relay that to the people. Mm-hmm. Who are now? You've got some diehards out there that mm-hmm. won't tell you anything. Right, tight lip. Yeah, yeah. And but we have a lot of people that do tell yeah, us what they're doing. Sure. And we'll you know we'll try to steer people in the right in direction. the right direction. Mm-hmm. And um, you know just just uh, we, I, there, there's a flat out there that there's the big red ears. Um, they spawn on every year. And when somebody rents a boat, I send them straight to the flat and I tell them how to catch those big red ears. And man, they go out there and they have a ball. That's cool. 
how how is the red ear population right now? Uh, I don't see as many big ones right now, but with the introduction of the blueback herring again, the blueback herring compete directly with the red ear, the bluegill, and green sunfish for forage. They're all plankton feeders. Mm. So now we just have to see what happens over the next couple of years, um, how detrimental it's going to be. Um, the blueback herring were not introduced by DWR. Um, I, I don't think somebody introduced them. I don't think that person had bad intentions. I think they, they thought they were helping. But, you know, we've got these people at DWR, these biologists who know this lake better than anybody. They know what to do, what not to do. We need to put our faith in those biologists and mm -hmm. let them handle it. So when you put the blueback herring in the lake, it, it could really hurt the panfish population of a fishery that was probably one of the top in Virginia for panfish. Mm -hmm. 95% of your people probably that are out there on boats are bass fishing. They couldn't care right. about the panfish. Um, personally, I love to catch those big bluegills and those mm -hmm. red ears. And, I mean, I like to catch all fish. Right. Um, we've weighed red ears out there that were two and a half pounds. Wow. Um, I haven't seen, you know, we've seen some 12 inchers this year. No 14s. Wow, that's a big sunfish. <laughs> and that's also the forage, though, too, for them. I mean, they're mm. fun to catch, like you're saying, but that's also part of that life cycle of, you yeah. know, that's all they're also <clears throat> eating those. Well, the the when they put the blueback herring in, they thought they were doing good. They thought the bass needed something mm. to eat. Right. But the bass were growing mm -hmm. 10, 11 pounds Without, on yeah. bluegills. Right, right. They had plenty to Correct. eat. They're not eating more because mm -hmm. there's blueback herring mm -hmm. in there now. Right. They're just, but they're not eating as many bluegill. Mm -hmm. But now your bluegill are going to be like, um, we're overpopulated on small bass out there. Right. So talk um, to that too, because we, we talked about that a little <clears> bit <throat> off air. And this, yeah. this idea that what people need to know too is uh, catch and release was a big push that in some ways had a lot of beneficial factors. But when you... Uh, get an overpopulation of a certain class uh, they can actually stunt the growth so yeah, kind of talk about what you think on that I set through a uh, I set through a uh, presentation of Jason uh, Hatcher mm -hmm. from uh, Halliker Halliker yeah from uh, DWR earlier this year up at regions 117 oh, cool. with the uh, friends of Lake Frederick organization yeah. and I saw the charts for the last um, uh, 20, 25, 30 years. And, you know, 20, 25 years ago, you know, lines represented the size of fish, you know, and your lines for the trophy fish were, say, eight inches long. And your mm -hmm. lines for your fish that were under 12 inches were eight inches long. So you had a balance. Mm -hmm. And throughout the course of the years, the line for the trophy fish kept getting smaller and the line for the small fish kept getting larger. Hmm. Now we're at a point that we have to take out a bunch of these fish that are under 12 inches. Why do you think that happened? Um, I think over harvest of big fish. Um, nobody harvesting the small mm -hmm. fish anymore. I mean, they put a slot limit in play at Lake Frederick from 12 to 18 inches. So... They DWR felt like, okay, that's the fish that reproduce. That's the fish we need to protect. So we're gotcha. going to protect the fish between 12 and 18 inches. People didn't want to keep the fish under 12 inches. Mm. They wanted the trophy fish that were over 18 inches, mm -hmm. but they didn't want the small fish. So I see people get up in arms whenever DWR comes out and shocks during the spawn. They think, oh my goodness, they're hurting the spawn. They're really not. You know, you, you could have, you know, for, for all they shock up, they shock minute areas of the mm -hmm. lake. They're right. not shocking the whole lake, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, you know, we, we've got to encourage people to harvest those fish mm -hmm. under mm -hmm. 12 inches. We need a bunch of them to go out. 
how is the bass like so we talked about the, the blueback herring and how they've affected the, the bluegill in the sense of their, their numbers and stuff and we talked a little bit about how it's changed the bass behavior but how have the blueback affected the size of the bass that are in there has it stunted them completely? it hasn't i don't think it has i think there's a natural progression going on with the bass getting smaller um which would it happens naturally in a lake mm -hmm. the bass get get smaller you know the trophy bass um I don't think it has benefited at all because we, we don't have a, an abundance of fish coming in that are just, you know, huge. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. we, it's, it's less and less every year. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, at the bait shop, I was weighing fish that were 10 and a half pounds my first year. I haven't, I haven't seen one of those come in again. Mm. In the last couple of years. See, I'm just so interested to know, because like, cause we had this guy, uh, Matt McCluskey, came mm -hmm. on the show, and he went out there with his panoptics, and he mm -hmm. stuck. Uh, it was a big one. It was over <laughs> over five, I think it was. Six, I think. Yeah. yeah, but he was using a mag draft, and he was mm -hmm. following bait and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I wonder, it's that chick, it's like that weird, is it because they've changed so much that people just can't target them because they don't know how, like you said? Yeah, I think. Or is it like there's a complete, like, just, they just fell off a cliff and they're just not in there anymore. And you could be having a combination of or both. a combination of well, both. Well, what, what, what we have to understand is the charts are, that's information that's all taken within 15 to 20 feet of the bank. Right. right okay. When they shock something mm -hmm, up, mm -hmm. it's got to be within 15. They can't shock in yeah, 30 feet of water. That's correct. So if the blueback herring are there and your big fish are out there with the blueback herring, they're not coming in. To be mm -hmm. shocked up. Now I have realized the last few years fish are spawning deeper yep, really. than they nice. ever have. Yes. Huh. Yeah, you, you might go out and see a bed in ten feet of water. Is that right? Yeah. That was gonna be my next question too. During the spawn, you should be seeing them, uh, or you know, anglers are catching them. Um, but to your point, if they're going deeper, then less apt to. I'm a firm believer, and this is from my own experience. I have no proof to what i'm going to tell you right now but i believe that the big bass spawn mm. weeks ahead of oh yeah i, yeah, I believe sure. that too of the mm. you know your five and six mm, pounders right. now i have seen 10 pound bass mm -hmm. swimming the lake this year mm -hmm. i have seen that but not on the bank right i've seen that under a school blueback herring and i've right. seen i've seen a school of mm -hmm. big fish. See, they're still, they're, they are still in there. And that goes back to that. Yeah. Um, one other thing real quick too, when you were talking about Halliker, what, another thing I like that these guys do that Greg does uh, joint effort with the state. Uh, Greg went is I've seen, I've seen it twice where uh, I want to say it was 200 Christmas trees. We did a hundred the first year. And then last year we kind of, Throwed caution to the wind and yeah. did, uh, we wanted to do 200 and we yeah, ended up right. getting like 250. Wow. But and, he's getting uh, the center blocks and the, and the concrete and the trees are donated and he pretty much preps them. Um, he and other anglers and I think we had our junior bass out yeah, there Yeah, junior bass came out one year. We and, have a lot uh, of residents from Lake Frederick yep, come out come and help. Out. And they, have, it's a great project where mm -hmm. there is really, it was interesting, you know, they basically built... Uh, and I've got pictures of it. You know, it was a TP structure. Well, two different ways. The first year was, was it, a yeah. pallet structure that was as triangular, and then they they took the trees over top of that, um, and that's what they sunk out there. And then the second year was just putting them in the center blocks. Right. Uh, but Jason and his crew would come in the day after that week, and they would take them out and and actually plant them. And that that information's on the web, their website or your yeah web, locations website, are website. actually Location. this year they, we got to pick where we wanted. Oh, that's great. Mm. And and it was really because I I went to some of the fishermen who have fished it like great. for years. I personally didn't pick a spot to put Christmas yeah, trees. Yeah. I asked fishermen, where would you like to have a reef? That's where would great. you like to? And, and I took, I had like 15 answers. Yeah. So we, we hmm. did those. Yeah. And those locations are on the on DWR the website, website yeah. of where they are. And yeah. if anybody has any questions to where they're at. And I think Fisher, and they also, I think we go back down and put a camera down. And I think. They uh, dive them, yes. They dive them. And those, yes. they're, they're working. Fisher are on them which is great and that's yes. good to know too when you know that there's you know habitat down there that yes. you know structure then that's going to be a place you want to fish too because there's going to be fish and the good there. thing is 95 percent of these things are whatever i, I say 95 percent, mm -hmm. but hmm. most of these things can be casted to from the bank that's great they're too. not out where you yeah. have to have a boat to catch them cool 
Now, I'd love to have them out there yeah. where people had to rent a boat to go out there right, and get, right, them. Right, get them. But they're they're within yeah. ca- the cast of the bank. And that's something that, again, I just, that a lot of people don't know that, that the work he's putting yeah. in, a lot of his own money that they're putting in to to make that fishery a better place and increase the chance of success for anglers. So I think that's hats off to you. Mm-hmm. You know, years ago, I went to Lake Frederick and I fished it. <clears throat> and I saw the bait shop there and I thought, mm-hmm. man, love to own that bait shop. Mm-hmm. That'd be awesome. And, you know, here I am now. I own the yeah, bait shop. It, yeah. Now I'm wishing I didn't own it so I'd have time to fish. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... um I care about the lake. Yeah, genuinely good. care about the lake. And you can tell. And then your other yeah. venture with uh, friends of of Lake Frederick. You was telling me a little bit about that. Uh, just kind of talk about that a little bit. And friends of Lake Frederick is an organization. I say that three times real fast. <laughs> um, it started with the homeowners at Lake Frederick. There, there's not any members that do not live there. Mm-hmm. It's a membership of homeowners who. Mm-hmm have an interest in keeping the lake green, keeping the lake prosperous, keeping the lake clean. Um, and because I own the bait shop, they've pulled me in as a sort of associate member. And I, I donate to their, you know, I give mm-hmm. them boats when they have a lake cleanup That's and, cool. you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, there's a thing at, at Lake Frederick because, you know, we all fished that lake in 1984 when there was no houses. Now there's people that have purchased land there. They have a house there. And there's a us versus them mentality mm-hmm. from both sides. Correct. Not just from one side, from both sides. Mm-hmm. So conversations I've had with some of the people are, hey, we need to bridge that gap. Mm-hmm. And you have... You have a Friends of Lake Frederick organization, mm-hmm. and there's a bunch of people over here that care as much about the lake as what mm-hmm. you guys do. Mm-hmm. And you can do a whole lot more with if you come together. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what I'm trying that's to good. do right now that's is to good. work that out because there are some great, great people mm-hmm. who belong to the Friends of Lake Frederick. Sure. Um, you know, years ago, I used to think all of them homeowners. <laughs> And now, since I've gotten to know them, you know, they do their own water quality surveys. Right, right. They do their own, you know, they built the trail around mm-hmm. the lake. Mm-hmm. Not on their property. It's on DWR property. Hmm, right. They built the trail. They footed the bill for it. Yeah. Um, they have a cleanup every year. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to get fishermen more involved. Now, this year we had a few mm-hmm. fishermen That's come good. out for the cleanup, which, which was really That's good. That's great, yeah. Um, I'd like to see a better turnout Correct. of the fishermen, but um, it, it it takes time. But it does, and, and to your point, you've said this. It, it comes back to that representation too. If you want, to, you just can't be. I can't stand the person. All they want to do is complain about something, but they don't want to be part of the solution. They don't want to get boots on the ground yeah. to help help get their hands dirty to help exactly with the solution. They just want to complain about it. Well, I don't have right. time for that because if if you're serious about it, you care about it, like you're saying. You're going to go ahead and come out here and help clean up. You're going to help be part of that. We, believe it or not, over the last, this summer, I noticed it more. I've actually seen people coming in with boats, Mm -hmm. fishermen, not Mm -hmm. members of Friends of Lake Mm -hmm. Frederick, but I've actually seen people coming in, carrying a trash bag and going over to the the trash receptor and throwing a bag of trash away. Well, as they're coming off the water. As they're coming off the water. And I I thought that was really cool. That's That's that's, awesome. um, That is. That's a good thing. Yes. So, uh, you know, it'll all, it'll all work out. Mm-hmm. Lake Frederick's 117 acres. There's mm-hmm. room there for everybody. Mm-hmm. The only thing, I, I, I wish people would just put enough faith in our DWR mm-hmm. to let them do their job. Mm-hmm. Don't try to help them. <laughs> if they ask for your help, yeah. then they'll, they'll, they'll let you know. Right. But let them do their job, what they're paid to do. Correct. Their, their livelihood depends on doing mm-hmm. a good job. Because mm-hmm. what people don't realize is... The more people who stop buying fishing license, mm-hmm. the more people who stop buying hunting license, mm-hmm. that takes revenue away from DWR and they Correct. can't do as much. Correct. So it doesn't benefit DWR to do a bad job. Right. That's and, right. And they put really qualified and really good people mm-hmm. in place to do That's these cool. jobs. I've known Steve Reeser for, oh my goodness, I can't even count the years that I've known Steve Reeser. Mm-hmm. Um you know, Brad was there, Brad yep, Fink, yep. such a great person. Jason, mm-hmm. 
Mm. Jason's a great guy. person. Yep. The people that come out with Jason are just mm. awesome. Yep. Um, we just need to let them do their deal and yeah. stop adding fish to Lake Frederick. Let them decide let them, what they yeah, want absolutely. in there. We talked about that before. Absolutely. But they are blue back herring. Yes. 100% blue back and he herring. He was telling the story about that. You know, he's again, he's seen it. He's seen it down mm -hmm. there and they come out, they may not be able to shock them up. You're not sure, but, but he, when he can produce it and show that like, you know, this is, this is coming out of here. I netted it, them up. I have a fish aquarium in my, t in my shop. Really? And they would come to the bank to spawn. I had talked to the biologist, said, man, there's blueback herring in here. He said, I haven't seen that in a shock survey. I said, I'm telling you, it's full blueback herring. Because <laughs> they always go out to deep water. You can't shock them in deep no, water. No, you can't. So one day they was there and they were spawning on the bank. I ran up to the bait shop and I got a big net and I scooped about 10 of them out of the water and I took them up and put them in a the fish aquarium. And I took a picture of it and I sent it to Jason. I said, what's this? He said, that's blueback herring. I said, okay. I took him out of the lake. I love you. Um, <coughs> no, like, and guys, maybe I'll do a hidden gems episode. I'll, I'll throw the live scope yeah. on it and teach people how to throw it because it, it fishes. It's such a cultural shift, mm -hmm. like to fish it. Unless you know how to fish it or yeah. grow up with it, it's different. Oh, and, yeah. I, and this is like, if this was like an investigation of a murder. It's like you put all these things together, where it's like you get rid of the vegetation, which is easy, and you get rid of fish that chase bluegill that are right next to the bank, mm -hmm. and then you you have these wolf packs now that are just cruising mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and you have more Christmas trees than like mm -hmm. Vienna, like yard sale right before mm -hmm. Christmas down there. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden these fish are not anywhere near the bank, generally speaking, mm -hmm. they're out there in the ether. And mm -hmm. if you try to like get a boat or a kayak and you're out there, mm -hmm. unless you have that visual knowledge of what these fish are doing, mm -hmm. it can seem pretty daunting yeah. to you, but they're there. You just, you got to make, when you see the blueback herring, you just have to make an extremely long cast. Mm -hmm. I, I say downsize your line, go to fluorocarbon fishing line because monofilament wants to float. Don't want to mm -hmm. let your bait down there. Go to fluorocarbon fishing line, which is three times as expensive, but um, make a long cast. It's because as soon as they hear that trolling motor, as soon as they hear that, they're they're gone. And actually, guys, what we're going to do, we might take a quick break here. So let this individual grab as much stuff as he wants from this shop and show what top mm -hmm. three, top three baits. Yeah. You and I was going to say, too, before he does that, just in, or in closing, before we close, just uh, again, he, if, for those who don't know, stop into his shop and talk to the man and see what he recommends to throw and check and see what he's got in the shop. And he's going to steer you in the right direction, like you say, and even show you where to point you where to fish. And, you know, over time you'll, you'll begin to have success. Well, I appreciate that, but we're mm -hmm. very, very low on stock because mm -hmm. as you know, they promised me a new bait shop. Right, and right. I'm, I'm still waiting that. patiently. Yeah. Uh, it was supposed to be open this summer. So we didn't make any orders right? because mm. I didn't want to fill the shelves and I right. have to move everything. Right. So this year was kind of a wash because we right. didn't fill the shelves. Mm. But this spring mm. we will have full shelves. Right. Gotcha. I'm going full force forward Good awesome. deal. With, a sh with a new shop or mm -hmm. without it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And that spy bait right there. Yep, I love them. It's really good. But you fish out on a six-pound test. You take that thing on a six-pound test, cast it out, and let it come through that score herring. They will eat it. So my cousin, I'm going to tell a spy bait story on that. Again, Brian fished that lake out there religiously. And then after some time, he started getting onto it. But a spy bait story about Lake Frederick. So when people come in and ask me, that's also one that I say, you know, you want to have one of these tied on. Mm -hmm. um, he throws it out, makes a long cast, sticks his rod under his arm and begins cleaning his glasses. Well, what people may or may not realize about the spy bait, it's literally the way it's weighted it's going to yeah. flutter down like this real slow. Right. And then whatever whatever depth you want to get at, just a slow reel back in. It's got props in the front and back, and it's a slow finesse type of bait. So in this process, though, of this, he gets done, puts it on, picks it up, bam, six-pounder on. Right. You know, and it was one of those do-nothing, just in the process of, like you said, getting mm -hmm. down there. It's, so, yep. It's, it's, th these are three baits that I throw. Of course, your dad knows when, before I had my shop, mm -hmm. I bought so many of these. Yep. I, he told me one time he ain't sold a lucky craft since I opened up my shop. But you get the deep divers and that ghost minnow. I even throw, this is a deep diver, but I take the 100, the, and mm -hmm. I go to the Susquehanna. Oh, yeah. I rape them on that. Oh, yeah. I got them guys throwing the 78s and yep. all. Mm -hmm. And I throw that. Mm hmm. And what I do different is, because that'll go down, the, the one I throw goes down six to eight feet. Rather than, 
pulling it to the side, I hold the rod up in here and I'm popping it this huh. way. It keeps it up. And I can stay in that two and a half, three foot of water. Interesting. And uh, my best day on the Susquehanna, I caught 111. Wow. I never come off the anchor. Dang. I stayed on the anchor all wow. day. Wow. And that jerkbait too, like I've learned, um, you know, everybody used to think, well, jerkbait cold water, which is, which is true. It will work, yeah. but, but again, don't, it, it can work mm -hmm. any time of year. And, and to your point, um, getting down into that depth there, you talked about before any bait, whether it be a crankbait, jerkbait or whatever, staying in that, that strike zone depth area. I mean, is I had a guy come into the bait shop one time. This guy was like seven foot tall. He was like a football player. He, came in, he looked at me, he says, <laughs> I want to know what bait you'd be throwing if you was out here fishing. I said, ghost minnow, lucky mm -hmm. craft is what I'd be throwing. Mm -hmm. You got one? I said, yeah. Not whatever. I think it was seventeen ninety nine or something like yeah. that. He said, man, that's a lot of money for a bait. I said, you asked me what I'd be throwing. I said, that's what I'd be throwing. <laughs> he went down on the pier and uh, he throwed that thing for an hour. Never, never got a bite. And I walked down on the pier because I get down. A lot of times I'll get down. If little kid's fishing, I'll... Mm. I'll you know, show them different things, try to get, just mm. the object is to get people to catch, catch fish. fish yeah. He come over and he said, I think I'm going to have to get my money back for that jerk bait. And Kyle Campbell was with me. He walked mm -hmm. down with me. And uh, I said, why, what's wrong with it? He said, I ain't caught no fish on it. I said, let me see a thing. And I knew that we had a structure right up there past yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. And I knew where the structure That's was, hilarious. you know, it was underwater. So I took that thing and I cast it out there and I reeled it down. Pop, 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 pop. Mm. Caught a six pounder on a jerk bait. First cast, I, I swung it up over the pier, unhooked it. I threw the fish back in the water, handed him a rod. Said, "Nothing wrong with that bait, buddy." <laughs> I turned around, walked away. Yeah. It was it was classic. A lot of truth to that. A lot of. And if you could hold the, the hold the, the big spoon up in the spy bait too, because those are, are more like very niche. And then right that camera right there. There you go. What's interesting about all these picks, guys, is they're moving baits. They all move. They're constant moving. One one is more of a pause. Blueback, if you ever watch them, Google a YouTube a video of a blueback. They're, they don't just chill there like a bluegill and just stare at you. They're moving always, they, always. They constantly move. Yeah. They are never. And the reason this, this is good is because it's got so much flash mm -hmm. in the school. And when mm -hmm. you get the wolf pack feeding mm -hmm. and they see that flash, when you're jerking that spoon, mm -hmm. then... They're, they're, they're yeah. attacking that spoon. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's, you know, sometimes they'll be hooked on the outside of their mouth when they hit it from the side. Sometimes they get the back of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll hit it in the front and you don't get a hook in them. Mm -hmm. But the spy bait is really more finesse. Yeah. You know, you cast it out, let it sink. And then just, I, there, I don't, I don't do a steady retrieve with it. Mm -hmm. I kind of fish it sort of like a jerk bait, mm -hmm. but I don't do the hard jerks like i do mm -hmm. with a jerk bait i'll just uh just pop it just mm -hmm. a little bit once it gets down to the depth mm -hmm. but the object <clears throat> for every bait is make the bait move mm -hmm. and keep it in the strike zone mm -hmm. if you pull it out of the strike zone when you're working it the fish are not coming over 10 feet to hit that bait anymore mm -hmm. you got to keep it in the strike zone mm -hmm. and then they'll they'll come up and get it and don't think that's too big because oh, no, again God. you go on oh, Matt no. McCluskey's page. You'll catch one pound fish on that. Yes. Yep. Because that's what they're targeting. Yep. Like the blue back, again, Google some pictures. I'll try to put some up on up above my head so you can look at it. They're massive. They're they're even bigger than that spoon. They can get really big. And these fish get conditioned to eating and chasing something like that. That's why, like on like Lake Hartwell, they fish striper poppers, like or pencil poppers or massive baits. And they'll launch those things over 30 feet of water in cane piles. Mm -hmm. And you saw this when they were there at the Forest Wood Cup, where you just see a bunch of guys just standing around staring. They're waiting for them to come up. Yes. And they just launch these big yeah. big things. And they're just ripping them as hard as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're uh the the blueback are always I, th I think they have to keep moving to stay alive. If they if they, they can't go backwards, mm -hmm. I, I think they have to continue. Okay. I've never seen one just sitting, even when they're spawning, how they, when they're actually laying their eggs, I've seen them lay their eggs on the bank down there and they're actually swimming on their side, laying the eggs, but they're still moving. They're not stopping to lay their eggs in one hmm. place. Interesting. Um, so bass, obviously, you know, a lot of people don't know, but there's some small mouth, not that it's not, this is not known as a small mouth, Lake, <laughs> but but there are some smallmouth in in there, and that again I think is uh, anglers yeah. putting something in that yeah, doesn't belong. Right, they they can't reproduce in Lake Frederick. There's right. no current. 
I think catfish. Too. I was going to say, well, let's I talk said, about yeah. catfish because I know we get a lot of guys mm-hmm. coming in, and we we send them, you know, Lake Frederick, because uh, it is you can fish from the bank, you know, yes. there in a lot of places. So yeah, talk about the catfish. There are some um, giant catfish in Lake Frederick. Really? Um, anybody that's not on the Facebook page wants mm-hmm. to see pictures yes, and stuff, point. they can send a request to Gregory's Lakeside Bait and Tackle, yep. and we'll welcome them to the page. Yep. Um, the only thing is, we don't. We don't talk any politics whatsoever on the page, and we don't knock anybody that makes a post. Right. If they say their fish is 24 inches long, <laughs> good job. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, There's some giant catfish in Lake Frederick. There has been some. Um, I'll send you a picture of one uh, that a boy caught last year, uh, probably a 30, 31-pound fish. Wow. Channel blue cats channel like, channels. Okay. It's just channel cats in, gotcha. in Lake Frederick. What are they uh, mainly catching them on? Um, Friday, um, early in the year, or... like right after the bass spawn, they come up on the dam. Now catfish can't spawn in Lake Frederick. Okay, they try. Um, really? they come up on the dam and they go through their spawning ritual there yeah. on the rocks. Interesting. And you can go out there, you, you can catch them on anything out there. You can catch them on minnows, you can catch them on night crawlers, you mm-hmm. catch them. We have really good luck on clam snouts. Okay. Uh, we sell clam snouts there. Um, and we have people, quite a few people, limiting out on catfish. Oh, wow. Um, they do well. And those that are new to Lake Frederick, when you pull in, you got your parking lot, you'll see the ramp. Uh, there is a fishing pier to the right, you'll see the bait shop to the right. The dam is, you won't even really see it from the parking lot. You have to kind of go to your left if you're looking at the lake. Exactly. There's a little path and goes up. And then, like he was saying, there's there's some riprap and rock there. Yeah, it's the all dam, riprap. So. And if you if you walk up on top of the dam and look down in the lake, mm-hmm. um, when the catfish are up, you'll think, my goodness, I'm not going to swim in that water. Because you'll see some giant wow. catfish swimming the, the rocks. Interesting. <laughs> And they're so big, people don't bring heavy enough tackle to get them in. Yeah, right. What's uh, the biggest catfish you've seen pull out of there? Um, personally seen was 26 pounds. That's not bad for a channel. <laughs> I think state record's 31 or 32 pounds. That's close, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, Could be down there. Oh, state I would... record. Can, yeah. It would not surprise me to see a Lake Frederick uh, come yeah. out as the, uh, the state top. record catfish. Wow. There's some giants. Um, as, as much as I'm there though, I see a lot of, like, I've seen 30 inch walleye come swimming past the pier. Um, huh. it's, uh, wow. there's some, there's some huge catfish. I'm, I'm talking catfish that are 12 inches across the head. Wow. Do you think that, you think the state records in there catfish wise? I, I don't know if the state record is, I think there is a state record in there. I think, I don't know if it's got the biggest catfish yeah. in Virginia. But can't um, confirm or deny, so you should go out there to a shop to find out, guys. That's right. So. <laughs> yeah, bring bring big gear. And, yeah. What are the crappie and the? Um, I heard that is there pike in there too. I heard some kind of rumor about that. There's northern pike. Hmm. There are a lot of northern pike. Who stocked that? DWR. Oh, that was DWR. It's a very popular fish to catch, and a pike is very good to eat. There are fishermen out there that catch them. Hmm. Hmm. They will eat a pike before they eat a crappie. Is that right? Um, there, there's been a lot stocked over the last couple of years. I want to say. Close to 10,000 stocked in the last few years. Um, but a lot of those don't make it to maturity. You, There's actually a feeding frenzy when they dump the truck. You see the bass coming in and tearing them up. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. But there's uh, there's some big northern pike out there. And then, go ahead. I've seen some northern pike that broke the 40-inch mark come out of there. Huh. Dang. Now, we've also had, um, and this I can remember back when this, you know, you start hearing this, and then he was able to confirm it. Uh, the snakehead made its way to the lake also, not stocked, obviously, Gee, by the state. Who, yeah. but, <laughs> I think um, it walked. I think it walked <laughs> over there, yeah, exactly. Now, actually, they, they, there, there's so many rumors. I had people texting me, oh, hey, I know how they got in there. Yeah. You know, a goose walked through a nest and it stuck to their feet, or, <laughs> uh, you know, a duck was eating and ate the eggs and yeah. crapped what? them out, and it's... I, Somebody put the snake heads in there. Yeah, and you've had you had video of the fry. Oh yeah, we well, actually so caught the fry. Caught the fry. Yeah, we had. Uh, they wanted samples, mm-hmm. and when we first found them in there, 
I was sitting at the desk one day and a guy came in and he told me, he said, man, he said, there's two snakeheads spawning up in this cove up here. And I'm like, okay. And then, but you know what's so funny? There's the same reaction anybody's going to give. Like when you talk about mm-hmm. whether it be the state or anybody, yeah, we're always like, yeah, I don't know. But So <laughs> I said, all right, I got to get in a boat. So I took a net and I put a sheet in the net. I had a sheet in my truck and I put that in the net. And I go up into the lake up into this cove. Well, I couldn't get in there to get the, mm-hmm. I saw the fry and I saw the two snakeheads, the male and the female. Mm-hmm. And they were, they, they, they were killing other fish that were coming toward their fry. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was, there were bluegills floating that they had killed. So I went into the shop and I, I made a phone call. I called, uh, Carl, Carl Martin was still there at the mm-hmm. time. I called Carl and then I called Brad and I told him, mm-hmm. I said, look, man, we do got a snake, a couple snake heads and there is a ball of fry. Mm-hmm. So I had this other guy come in and he's like, oh, I'm going to catch him fry. I said, okay. I just tried and I couldn't get him. Oh, I'll, I'll go get him. I said, okay, here's a bucket. Bring me some back. He come back with like 500 fry Did in the bucket. Really? Yeah. Wow. And he's like, here, give these to him. I said, okay. So I gave, um, I froze some of them, mm-hmm. and Carl Martin was on his way to uh, mm-hmm. Richmond, mm-hmm. and we handed him a container that had a couple mm-hmm. hundred live ones, and we gave him a couple hundred mm-hmm. frozen ones. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point, I, I felt like they had caught four or five that year. I, I felt like they were all out of there. Mm-hmm. And then um, a couple years ago, I saw one in a beaver hut, mm-hmm. um, chased a spinnerbait. And I know I, I was sure it was a snakehead. And then this year, uh, DWR shocked up. They they took one that was ten inches out, mm-hmm. and then they shocked up one that wouldn't fit in their net. Wow! And I actually went back to that same spot well, a week and a half later, and I hooked into it, and probably the shortest fight in history because I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough for that fish. That yeah. fish was that fish a fifteen to eighteen pound fish. Wow! I mean, she's huge. Now it's important to say too. I was just thinking that if you're if you're first time watcher viewer of this fish in the DMV podcast and or first time of hearing this about snakehead being in there, go back and watch the John Odenkirk uh, mm-hmm. episode on snakehead and realize that they've been in I think Potomac over twenty years. Now in saying that, what every biologist will tell you and what Greg says and everybody and they're all exactly right. Do not introduce fish to a body of water that you think that is good or bait fish or anything like that. Um, we would never condone that. It's not good. It's not healthy. But I wanted to say, though, that don't go running around with your hair on fire and, and panicking over that bait. That, now we, and you don't know what it is going to do. It, it's okay. It may be in the Potomac. It may not be good for Lake Frederick. It's too early to tell. But uh, in saying that, it is too early to tell. So don't. Don't have an opinion either way. I mean, you can have an opinion, but don't go crazy either way I, because it's probably going to be okay. So don't. Get yeah, I, I, I I've got an opinion of my own on the Potomac, right. and 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 my opinion is I I fished the Potomac before the snakeheads, mm-hmm. and I have fished the Potomac after the mm-hmm. snakeheads. Mm-hmm. Um, fishing was way better before mm-hmm. the. Now, I could have been in some of those right. years when you right. had a really high productive right. rate, mm-hmm. and you had right. you know five six years before that you had right. a great spawn and. Yeah. But um, I don't think the snakeheads will be detrimental to Lake Frederick. Right. Um, there's not enough mud bottom mm. in Lake Frederick for them to really get a stronghold the way mm. there is in Lake Brittle. Gotcha. Um, you got a lot of rock bottom in mm. Frederick, which mm-hmm. they don't like. Gotcha. Um, Frederick has got an enormous amount of fishing pressure, and mm-hmm. as hard as it's fished and as aggressive as they are, mm-hmm. there, there would be, you know, there should be a lot of them being caught mm-hmm. if there's a bunch in there. Right, right. Now, we don't want to see a bunch of them in there. Correct. But now with the blueback herring and and everything, there's stuff in there for them to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they're detrimental. I really don't. And I really think it's interesting because we had we had, um, we had had John on, John Mulliken of uh, Maryland DNR. And he said something that's very interesting. And this is the through line because, guys, with all these episodes, I edit and re-edit all of them. And I and I keep notes and stuff. And through line, all the guys from the DNR say is native versus invasive, native mm-hmm. versus invasive. And we had this guy on. Uh, he watched the episode. It's actually tracking now. It's like the number three episode ever right now, which is with Sikorsky, who runs the Chesapeake Bay Association. And 
everyone looks at the snake head like it's this big ugly thing because it's the poster child for it but he says like and i came up with this analogy that the blue catfish is like the feral hog to the chesapeake bay is the same thing that texas has with feral hogs <clears throat> they breed insanely and they eat everything mm-hmm. and the snakehead from what odenkirk says it, it has its niche it, mm-hmm. it lives in crappy water conditions mm-hmm. it breathes air it doesn't eat like the blue cats mm-hmm. do mm-hmm. but the snakehead has gotten this poster child thing of like this is the thing that's going to eat your dog mm-hmm. like even odenkirk told us the story people from golf courses mm-hmm. calling him up because this thing is going to kill him and so far, based on what he said in his research, mm-hmm. it hasn't turned out to be the case where this mm-hmm. thing's destroying fisheries. Mm-hmm. And it's just very interesting, our, our perception mm-hmm. and what reality Correct. actually is. Correct. We actually, um, I paid one time to go on a blue catfish uh, charter mm-hmm. on the Potomac River. I caught a 56-pound blue cat wow. on that trip. Who'd you go out with? Um, F- Fish Freaks Guide Service. Fish Freaks Guide Service? Okay. Mm-hmm. We weren't throwing them back because they are invasive at the time they wanted them dead they didn't want them mm-hmm. back in the water yeah. so we were you know dispatching them as we called them he actually cut a blue cat open mm. had a four pound large mouth in it wow so there's your that's your evidence, you know yeah. <clears throat> there's your that's, culprit that's for the yeah. bass fishing now i say i fished the potomac mm. river before the snakeheads right. but that was also before you know the blues before got, the blue cats yeah. correct so, you know, and if you go mm-hmm. to the mouth of Swan Creek, um, right below the spoils, and you get in about 20 couple feet of water, you can mm-hmm. sit there and catch 10 and 15 pound blue catfish, one right mm-hmm. after another. So, and they're eating bait the size of your fist. They're eating wow. everything. And again, it's just like, it's more education. I think they're fun to catch. And Je- Je- the, Jeff Green really brought this to mind to me when we had our earliest fishing report. We said like, yeah. The bass fishing gets slow in the summertime, mm-hmm. but I can go out there and catch flathead and people are happy. Mm-hmm. So, like, I get it. Like, it mm-hmm. is part of the ecosystem now and you can't change mm-hmm. it. But how do we balance it out? Or what can we do to make sure, like, everyone is happy at this point? Mm-hmm. I just think in future, moving forward, we just we have that understanding again, like everybody's saying. Don't take it upon yourself to think that you're going to introduce something. I mean, I was kind of explaining to him, too, as we're, as we're stocking... Um, like holiday, you know, we're doing smallmouth, um, walleye, and crappy. You know, a lot of people are talking about the F1 strain. So I have that conversation. I've had the conversation with Halleck, or had the conversation with Odenkirk, had the conversation with um, our hatchery guy, Fenders, who's third generation, you know, talk to him about it, you know, because they've got those over at Lake Frederick. Mm-hmm. And you just, you know, even though they're putting them in Smith Mountain Lake, they're putting them in other lakes. Uh, and he said it earlier about how important it is to really, before you go and do something, educate yourself and talk to people. And when it comes to state fisheries, the other, so the other thing that we do is we make sure before any fish goes in to said body of water, we get the pa- yeah. proper paperwork right. signed off from the state. And then also, like they were, we were saying earlier too, making sure you have health papers, you know, as well to make sure we're not we're not bringing disease in. And you, I think if you just do those things, then we can ensure moving forward that we're not doing something that's going to be detrimental to the... If, if it's all about catching fish, mm-hmm. you want to be able to catch fish. Everybody wants it to be easy. Right. It's, it's not always easy. Correct. Um, let's, let's learn to catch the fish we have. Correct. That's right. And, and um, it can be done. There's people who do it that's every right. day. That's I mean... Right. I can catch fish at Lake Frederick, but not like a mm. lot of them guys that have been fishing it. I mean, mm. there's guys out there that they're catching 10, 11, 12 good fish, mm-hmm. you know, right. and night fishing is oh, that productive. Was the other thing I oh, yeah, that'd be quick. good. Night fishing, because I know, you know, I've talked to uh, King a little bit and he's, you know, and it's interesting to see the guys that several guys in there that have either had the lake record or caught more big bass, uh, big bass daddy, you know, so... Uh, different guys that are they're good anglers uh, but anyway his story was kind of he happened on it kind of by mistake uh, he'd had some back issues and stuff and different things and and was awake one night actually went out to the lake and did really well at night and then from right. after that time he said you know then it became kind of routine where he come home from work maybe you know uh, get to get to sleep get some hours of sleep and then wake up at midnight 11 12 o'clock get out there and fish uh in the middle of the night and has had great success catching big bass in the middle it's of the very night. good to catch big bass yeah. well you don't have any fishing pressure and mm-hmm. i think the fish have got conditioned i, I don't know how much they can reason mm-hmm. but i think they 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 know when they're safe and mm-hmm. when they're not and I, I think at night 
they don't hear all the commotion on right. the water. They're more more inclined to come, you mm-hmm. know, to, to, to come feed. Yep. Now, <clears throat> I don't believe I have ever caught a bass in Lake Frederick after it got dark to after midnight. Interesting. I have fished I've several heard times. Two o'clock in the morning is what I'm hearing. I have fished several times. I'd go out and fish right before dark, and mm-hmm. I'd fish till daylight. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I've ever caught a fish before midnight. Mm. And then after midnight, so weird. Huh. you'll catch a few. It's really, yeah. mm-hmm. And um, my favorite bait for night fishing out there is a Colorado Blade yep. Midnight Special yep. spinner bait. Yep. And the way I fish it is completely different than the way anybody else fishes them. Um, I throw that thing out. I let it go to the bottom. Mm-hmm. I reel up the slack. Mm-hmm. And I rip that thing like I'm setting a hook. Oh, cool. And I let it fall back down. I'll Water reel down. up the slack mm-hmm. and I'll rip it again. Mm-hmm. And then one of those times you rip it, you're actually setting the hook. And wow. I actually, I caught five fish over seven pounds one night doing that. Wow. So now yep. that was years ago. Yep. Let it sink to the bottom. Like he's saying, rip it, slow roll it. Just get that blade thumping. But they do. And, and the thing about night fishing, for those that don't do it, I, I mean, I like it. Um, I think you become a better angler too, because you're also not distracted by things just you know going on around you. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, it's you in that bait because there's nothing else to look at because right. it's dark out. And well, you're concentrating on you're that. You're concentrating bait at that on point. that bait exactly. You're dialed into that. And then the other thing to keep in mind is, yeah, it's dark out, but everything will work. Your jigs will work just the same. Anything you throw in the daylight, throw in the night because those fish. You got to figure again. That's their environment. They go through that every day. I mean, we're sleeping at night, but they're like you're saying, they're out hunting. Plus, the thing that I think happens at night, especially in the summertime, is your your nighttime temperatures. Sun goes down, your temperature drops, and you're going right. to get your cooler temperatures, and they're going to tend to to feed up more, and maybe even push up shallow sometimes too mm-hmm. in the middle of the night. So that feeding right. window is going to be greater. So just if you've never done it, go out and do it. And uh, but but. And don't you don't have to change anything. Throw anything that you normally would throw, and that bite will be exactly the same. Yeah, just make sure you have. If you go out with a kayak, make yes. sure you got lights on Good it. Make point. sure I you thought of that. Yes, because everything's got to yeah, be. Be careful. Yes. You know. Absolutely. Uh, and you get Safety. really good at getting your baits out of out trees, trees too, yeah, because right. you're casting. You can't. There's, yeah. I've been out there black dark and you yeah. you can't see you're just throwing it. I hope yeah. I hear that thing splash. Yeah, splash and yeah. Is yeah. there uh, for the people that don't know about Lake Frederick? Is there like a time limit on when you're allowed? And this kind of gets back to what you mm-hmm. said about night fishing. Is the lake ever closed? Is no. it have times it's not allowed to be? Okay. Lake is open twenty four seven, three hundred sixty five days a year. Um, that's one thing that you know you got to hand it to DWR. They they are making it. Um, they make it good for people. Correct. This year, they're actually every year prior to this year, um, when my bait shop would close in October, um, they would pull the mm. toilets. There'd gotcha. be no portable toilets there. Hmm. Now they have a contract with a oh, good for them with a company that is going to keep toilets there all year long, and they're cool. going to maintain the toilets That's all year great. long. So if people want to go out there after my bait mm. shop's closed, you'll still have. Facilities. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Good. Yeah. So, uh, before we before we wrap this up, what is one thing you'd like to see happen at Lake Frederick? Good question. The big thing I'd like to see happen is I'd like to see the divide between the people who don't live there mm-hmm. and the people that do live there. I'd like to see the divide between them diminish. Mm-hmm. So, like like having Republicans and Democrats come together in, in unity. Yeah, like that's going to happen. I think we got a chance. Of, politics, but. I, th- I think that, uh, no, I, I think I would like to see more participation from the people who, um, th- this Friends of Lake Frederick thing, these people really care about the lake is not any more than what the people who have fished there for years. Right. Everybody's got the same interest. That's right. But if everybody would just get together now, mm-hmm. Friends of Lake Frederick is having a on October first. They're having sort of a uh, get together at Regions One Seventeen. Okay. They're going to have a lot of people from the community there. They're going to be doing some. Um, Jason's going to be there with his shock yeah. boat and demonstrate that. Right. They're going to have a lot of speakers. What time is that? 
Um, I think it starts at nine in the morning, okay. but I'm not one hundred percent sure. Check it out on Facebook. Or... But uh, it's not open. They're not advertising it okay. to the public, gotcha. but they are not going to turn public away. Gotcha. If public comes, hmm. they're going to welcome them. Okay. And I, I, you know, I would encourage people to go mm-hmm. get to know some of these people mm-hmm. because some very knowledgeable people in there, and they. They genuinely, they, they not only care about the lake, they care about the environment around the lake. Yeah, that's cool. And it's, um, you know, they got a guy that's going around marking trees that they really don't want around the lake, that they're going to cut down and make fish structure out gotcha. of. Gotcha, that's cool. And they're doing that hand in hand with DWR. I there mean, you go. Jason Hallicher is very active with, yeah. with everybody. He's very, he's proactive yes. with stuff. Now that, and that, there's another great example where, this person may not be an angler, but yet they're yep. they're doing something behind the scenes you don't even know about mm-hmm. uh, that will end up being fish structure and uh, and habitat, and that's you know it's a win win again. It's a win-win. and and I'm uh, I, I'm actually donating a couple guided trips mm-hmm. um, for them to auction off at this uh, mm-hmm. you know guided trip. I'm going to offer a guided trip on uh, the Shenandoah, and I'm going to. Cool auction one off for Lake Frederick mm-hmm. and there you go yeah you know, if anybody's out there and really wants to go out with me if they they call me a couple of weeks ahead of time mm-hmm. I'd be I'll take my boat out and take people fishing and that's show awesome. them things I'd, I'd be glad to do it that is awesome. that's really cool that's so, another and we said that before like just you make these connections and uh you know that's what I love about the fishing industry too people like Greg that are willing to you know take people out and help them catch fish and I mean, that's again, like you said, that's what it's all about. I mean, you know, you can you can edit this out, but I had I had a woman come in three years ago. She went, spent about hundred bucks at Walmart, bought a fishing rod, bought mm-hmm. some, you know, bought everything she needed at Walmart. Mm-hmm. She didn't spend no money at my shop. Mm-hmm. She come walking in. Her son was like six years old. She said, "It's his birthday." No, I said, "Happy birthday!" And uh, she said, she handed me the held this stuff up. And she said, "We don't have a clue." I said, well, "Let me help you." So I rigged up his rod for him and everything. And I said, I wasn't real busy at the shop. I said, mm-hmm. would you like to make it down here and show you how to catch some bluegills? Six years old, he's going to be tickled to catch yeah, some bluegills. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Yeah, I'd like that. So I took him down. And you know, the bluegills swarm around the pier down right. there. A little piece of red worm on there. And I showed him how to throw it out and everything. And he's sitting there catching these bluegills, having a ball. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm looking. I see this huge bass swim up the bank. And I seen her go up there and she was in a, she went into a fish structure yeah. up there. I looked at him. I said, I'll be right back. And I went up and I got this rod rigged up with a slip bobber and I'll catch a little bluegill and pitch it up there <laughs> for the bass. So I went up and I got it. And I come back down. And I said, buddy, I said, catch me one of those little bluegills, would you? He said, yeah. So I caught him. A little, he caught me a little bluegill. And I took that thing and I pitched it up there at the yeah. fish structure. And almost she came out there and she was right under the bluegill. And I looked at that boy's mom and him, and I said, I said, uh, y'all might want to come watch this. So they come up. She said, what are we looking at? I said, you see the bobber? She said, yeah. I said, look right under the bobber. I said, you see a little bluegill? And she's like, oh, yeah, I see that. And the little boy, I said, you see it? And he said, yeah, I see it. I said, look right under the bluegill. He said, what is that? I said, it's a big bass. He said, oh, my. Well, once it took it, the bass took the bluegill. And he's standing there, and I said, "You want to catch that fish?" And I'm, I'm, I'm feeding it line. Mm-hmm. You know, I want it. Mm-hmm. He's like, "Yeah, I like catch that." I said, "All right." I said, "I'm gonna set the hook, and I'm gonna give you this rod, and it's all you." He said, "Okay." So I closed it, locked it up, and the line started tightening up. And I set the hook, and I handed him a rod, and I said, "It's all you, buddy." He fought that fish, and he fought that fish, and he fought it. Finally, he got it. He couldn't get it up over the pier. I said, "You want me to get it up over the pier for you?" And he's like, "Yeah." So I got it up over the pier. He wouldn't hold it to take a picture. Mm-hmm. So I held it over there in front of him. And he's standing there smiling. Yeah. And uh, but that's what that's all that's about for me. That's awesome. Yep. To to get make a memory. See the kids. Yep. Get hooked. You know that, that's that, that's why I like doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. But Good that was stuff. that's just. I think that was my most memorable one. Yeah. It's been a bunch. Yeah, sure. But oh, um, cool. I had one where I was king down there one evening. I had two little twins who were fishing. Every time I throw a Cinco out, a fish would hit it. I'd set the hook and I'd hand it to one of them. He'd reel it in and I'd throw it back out. Fish take it. I'd set the hook. I'd hand it to the other one. We did. They each caught like six. It was, it was great. That's cool. 
Yeah. That's freaking really awesome. Yeah. So thank you so much again for coming for coming out. And then guys, link in the episode description to everything. Uh, if you're in Winchester, stop by Jake's Bait and Tackle, get anything that you need, and then go by the lake uh, and try like Frederick sure. out. You know, it's not as much of a cruel mistress as you might think. Again, like and subscribe to the channel. We are the only uh, fishing podcast for the greater DMV metropolitan area. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.